Today, we're going to be speaking with Thomas Homer Dixon, who's the executive director of the Cascade Institute at Royal Roads University in British Columbia, Canada. His new book is Commanding Hope, the power we have to renew a world in peril. Uh, some of you may may recognize his name because he was also the author of an article we spoke about in January called The American Polity is Cracked and Might Collapse. Canada Must Prepare. It's really great to have you on today. I appreciate your time. Delighted to be with you, David. So your article was essentially written as a cautionary message to Canada about you know, us, uh, the the traditionally democratic neighbor to the south and the possibility that by 2030, the U.S. could become, uh, to use your term, a right wing dictatorship. Um, can can we start by talking about uh, that? That's only eight years, a relatively short amount of time. What would be the path for the U.S. to become that over the next eight years? In the article, I postulate that Donald Trump is reelected in 2024. And that is really the critical stage in the process that could see the de devolution of American democracy into uh, an authoritarian regime of some kind. And people have been beating around in the in the bushes about this using various terms, autocracy, authoritarian regime. But I just say, look, if we're going to have one person putting himself above the rule of law in the United States, then, then that is a dictatorship, and we should just call it a dictatorship. So a, a critical stage would be Donald Trump's re-election. I don't know whether he would actually consolidate the a, a right-wing dictatorship in the United States. It might take a period of time. It might be one of his successors. But I think he would put democracy in the United States in extreme jeopardy. I, I don't think there's any doubt about that. He would return to office with the goals of vindication and vengeance, really. And he would be unleashed, given that it would probably be his last term in office. And uh, I think that creates enormous concern around the world, not just within the United States. Yes, so this was a warning to Canadian citizens to start preparing for this possibility. The, the word dictatorship can mean in practice many different things. And sometimes there's associations with uh, police states, um, uh, you know, uh, just willy nilly imprisonment of media or political dissidents, uh, people as you know, we sometimes say jokingly, although it's not a joke, accidentally stabbing themselves 10 times when they happen mm. to, you know, this type of thing. W which of these characteristics do you think would be plausible in such an American circumstance? That's a very good question. I lay out a number of pathways in the article. Uh, the most benign, I would be, I, I would say, is something resembling, and this wouldn't really qualify as a dictatorship, of course, would something resembling Viktor Orban's illiberal democracy in Hungary. Yes. But I think we could go all the way through to something closer to what we see in Russia right now under Vladimir Putin. That seems extreme and seems in, implausible, I think, for many people, especially on the liberal end of the spectrum. But some of the rhetoric that you're hearing now on the right uh, against media, for instance, lock them up, shoot them, uh, even from people who are are increasingly accepted as part of the mainstream discourse in the United States. It's rhetoric that you would expect from uh, of, of people who want to impose that kind of uh, brutality within the American polity. So one of the points I make within the article is that uh, uh, a, a critical development here is the propagation of what uh, scholars call a hardline security doctrine in the United States. Uh, and it's been associated with some of the most brutal regimes that have transitioned from democracy. And I use the example of Weimar Germany in the 1920s and 30s, that have transitioned from democracy to a dictatorship. And a critical element of that process has been the propagation of a hardline security doctrine, which suggests for people who adhere to it that there are uh, individuals within the society and groups within the society embedded across the society within civilian sectors of the society that are um, enemies of the state, who are an enemies of the nation more generally, and who have to be uh, identified and ostracized or even eliminated. And that kind of rhetoric is now becoming much more common on the right in the United States, and that's a precursor of uh, of not just not just a, a soft authoritarian regime, but it's the kind of thing you would see as a precursor for a much more brutal regime.
in the um, in the aftermath of the 2020 election, which Donald Trump, who lost, claimed that he won, uh, we were I mean, whether we were surprised is a, is a question, but many of us were certainly distraught that more than half of the Republican Party believed it. They, they at least said that they believed that Joe Biden did not really win that election. Can you talk a little bit about in this potential dictatorial slide? How important does it matter whether a significant portion of the population buys the lies of the would be dictator? Oh, it matters enormously. I mean, it's the one of the critical elements here that is a poison. And again, it's quite similar to that. That false falsehood, the big lie is quite similar to the falsehood that the Nazis used to uh, to in reinforce their own legitimacy, the stab in the back, the, the, the idea, and again, listen to the sort of the rhetoric of the hardline security doctrine, the idea that there was a group in this particular principally uh, Jews within within Germany who had conspired against Germany during the second world during the first world war at the end of the first world war and had stabbed Germany in the back and it defeated Germany from within and and uh, so the the lie that's being propagated now the falsehood uh, that um, the election was stolen from Donald Trump and the, and widely believed and accepted by supposedly somewhere around 70% of Republicans now. Yeah. Uh, so what are we looking at? 30% of the American electorate, 25 to 30% of the American electorate. Uh, it, it, you, you, you can seize power within a society with a mobilized and coordinated fraction of the society that large, 20 to 30%, absolutely, 100%. Mm -hmm. If if everybody else is squabbling and disorganized and not realizing what the nature of the danger is, and not reinforcing the the, the institutions of democracy, it, it it's certainly large enough to uh, impose a, a an institutional transition on the society away from democracy. So yes, that 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 falsehood and the fact that it's widely believed and a substantial proportion of of Republicans also believe that violence is justified in returning Trump to the presidency or would be justified uh, is, as I say within the article, it's poison within the body politic of the United States. And it's you, coursing through the entire body politic now. You mentioned um, World War Two and pre-World War Two era Germany. There's been I mean, for decades at this point, you hear some on the American right and maybe elsewhere say if the Jews had had guns, the Holocaust wouldn't have happened. Historians have looked at this. It's been widely debunked and explained away. Um, I, I, I am curious about what you imagine. I mean, gun culture in the United States is very different than than in Canada. And um, I'm curious what you imagine the potential role of civilian owned guns to be in an authoritarian takeover of the US. And this is with the specific reality that it's definitely more of the folks who believe the big lie that would be likely to have the guns. And this is why, among many of my liberal friends, many, many are now saying I'm not a big gun person, but I don't want them to be the only ones with the guns. Give us a sense of whether you know you have some thoughts as to the role of civilian owned guns in such a world. Mm, you know, it's enormously important. Uh, so in a sense, and you're being very gentle in your description of the situation, by the way, <laughs> <laughs> in, in a sense, what we have is, an, is the development of an arms race and a, a weapons race between different ideological camps in this highly polarized society and, right. the, and a disintegration of what social scientists call social capital, which is the trust, the bonds of trust and reciprocity that help bind societies together. Societies with high social capital tend to prosper, solve their problems effectively, and those without don't. And we're seeing that it's a, it's a terrible degenerative process. And I think guns are a, a, a really important element of that because they induce a lot of fear, as, just as you were describing. And the fear causes the retreat to what, what um, political scientists call a kind of self-help situation where you feel you have to take care of yourself. And we mm -hmm. all feel that. And um, now the irony is that the Second Amendment and the gun culture in the United States is ideologically justified uh, on the right by the fear of a tyrant, 
right? That that we need yeah. to we need to maintain our capacity to rebel against an authoritarian state because that's part of the it's almost the civic religion of the United States going back to the revolution and and justifiably in in a lot of ways. Of course, the Second Amendment is completely wildly misinterpreted from its original intent. Um, uh, but uh, yes, I would say that the folks who tend to support an authoritarian shift or would support an authoritarian shift in the United States, who are not supportive of democracy as it currently exists in the United States, uh, will tend to have a disproportionate uh, a number of these weapons, 400 million currently, I think, in the civilian population in the United States is just breathtaking. Now, what would happen at, you have all these heavily armed people around and you have a, a, a the implementation of a, 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 an authoritarian regime which would have elements of a plutocracy probably because it would um, be supported by wealthy, certain elements of wealthy elites in the United States. Uh, what's going to happen to all these folks who are heavily armed who suddenly find that they actually really are living within a, a dictatorship? Mm. Uh, and that's an interesting question. You might actually find that there's a great deal of opposition from folks who might have otherwise supported or originally supported the shift in the institutions. At this point where it's complete speculation, we have really no idea where things could go, but it's, again, uh, what I was doing in my article was just opening up these questions because in Canada, we need, at least need to start considering them and talking about them. What do you think the role has been from seeing um, uh, what's happening in Russia, for example, or um, it, in in other countries around the world where I mean, really, it's it's these sort of authoritarians that Donald Trump sometimes played coy with and sometimes mm -hmm. even expressed admiration for what what sort of effect do you think that has had on the population in the United States? So this is a really interesting question and a development and somewhat unexpected. I mean, I, I've been watching Putin's buildup of arms since since last year, and I actually felt that it was quite likely he was going to attack Ukraine. But I hadn't expected, first of all, what we've seen is a democratic rallying around the world, the rallying of democratic countries to come together yeah. in, in, in the defense of Ukraine. Uh, and all of the folks like Viktor Orban and Jared Bolsonaro and uh, Marie Le Pen in France, all of the folks who had cozied up to Putin in various ways, heading for the exits because all of a sudden they've been substantially delegitimized. I mean, l l this is a real world lesson in what happens when you get a dictatorship. Dictatorships tend to go to war. Democracies don't go to war with each other. It's one of the strongest empirical laws or generalizations in the social sciences. It's called the democratic peace hypothesis. If you end up with something like Putin or uh, an authoritarian regime, you're much more likely to go to war because what happens with these folks, and this is part of what's happening in Russia, is as their legitimacy declines internally, because authoritarian regimes tend not to solve their problems very well, they have economic crises and things, as their legitimacy and popularity declines internally, they pick fights with their enemies or with external enemies and uh, to try to build up, the leaders try to build up their authority and popularity internally by picking fights externally. So, so we're, we're getting a very vivid lesson in the kind of world we will be creating if we give up on democracy. And I think in an extraordinary way, this is a silver lining from this, this war. I mean, it's a terrible, terrible situation, but it's sort of reminded everyone in, in the world what's at stake. And uh, I, think, I think it actually puts Donald Trump in an interesting way in something of a, a vulnerable position in the United States as we come into, for instance, the midterms and the, and the presidential election campaign. That'll be very interesting to see uh, in terms of what what impact it has for sure. Uh, we're going to link to Thomas Homer Dixon's article that's been the jumping up, jumping off point for our conversation today. The new book is Commanding Hope, the power we have to renew a world in peril. I so appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. Thank you.